From the newsrooms of the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age, this is Please Explain. I'm Samantha Selinger Morris. It's Wednesday, January 31st. When a militia, believed to be backed by Iran, killed three American soldiers in Jordan over the weekend, it marked a dangerous new development in the war in the Middle East. It was the first time in the more than three months since Hamas launched its attack on Israel that any American troops had died from hostile fire in the conflict. So could this tip the United States into a full-blown war with Iran? It's a situation that American President Joe Biden has been actively avoiding since October 7th. Today, political and international editor Peter Harcher on the factors that could push Biden to take this step and the global mayhem that could result if he does. So first of all, I think we have to say welcome back to Peter Harcher. To, Thank you, Samantha. To please explain, because you've been off for summer break, and it's a thrill to have you back in the studio. It's a pleasure, but it was a greater pleasure to be on the beach, I have to tell you. <laughs> to be completely honest. That, that's absolutely fair enough. Uh, and now, of course, we're going to get to matters that are very unbeach like because, Peter, over the weekend, there was a significant escalation in the war in the Middle East, and this time it involved an attack on an American military base in Jordan. So tell us what happened over the weekend. Well, the short version is that a terrorist group a militia group, which is uh, very likely backed, armed, funded, coordinated by Iran, attacked a small U.S. base in Jordan, killing three U.S. soldiers and injuring, on the latest numbers, more than 40 American soldiers. Three service members killed in a drone strike on a U.S. base in Jordan. U.S. officials say they're confident Iranian proxies are responsible. The killings could significantly escalate an already volatile military situation in the Middle East. These are the first deaths of American troops in the Middle East under hostile fire since the October 7 terrorist attack against Israel. The slightly larger story is that this is the latest in a long continuum of attacks on U.S. interests, soldiers' bases in the Middle East. Since that October 7 Hamas attack against Israel, there are various numbers you see around, but the most authoritative I've seen is that this was the latest of 180 attacks by various Iranian-backed militias against U.S. troops in the region. So it's really the death of American soldiers here. That's what distinguishes this as so different from the previous strikes. Precisely. U.S. soldiers have died, and that's new. And so how has President Joe Biden responded? He said the U.S. will respond in its own time and its own way without specifying. And we shall respond. From the outset, we've been very clear in warning that anyone looking to take advantage of conflict in the Middle East and try to expand it, Don't do it. Others, notably in the Republican Party, have not been quite so... Measured? uh, Measured, yes, measured. I was going to say uh, mysterious, but measured is good too. There's been a chorus of Republicans demanding that the US retaliate not just by striking the proxy group, a ragtag outfit that calls itself the Islamic resistance in Iraq, but that it strike the sponsor, the power behind this group, which is Iran itself. Attack the proxy facilities in all of those countries, especially in Yemen, but don't degrade them 20, 30 percent. Eliminate them. Take them out. Senator Lindsey Graham says that the White House should take immediate and strong action, saying hit Iran now, hit them hard. What are the chances? Now, if the U.S. were directly to attack Iran, that would be a completely new development. It would be... uh, tantamount to an act of war. Well, it would be an act of war. So far, although there have been lots of these attacks against the US, none has come from Iran directly. Iran has been very careful to use proxies only. Its proxy groups uh, around the region have been described as a ring of fire, by the way. Hamas, Hezbollah, groups like this one, the Islamic resistance in Iraq, and a dozen more smaller groups. But Iran has been scrupulous about not attacking the US directly because, from what we can tell, Iran does not want a war with the US and has said so. And the US, likewise, Joe Biden at least, has said the US does not want a war with Iran. So for the US to cross that line would be a a major change, a major escalation, and a new war 
with a powerful nation state. And so do we actually know if this was a deliberate attempt by Iran to escalate the conflict or if, as has been suggested in some circles, this was sort of just unintentionally successful by yeah, by this Iranian <laughs> Unintentionally. So the Iranians have said it was not them. They have said this is being misused as an attempt by uh, hawks to drag us into a war with the US and we are not interested in a war with the US. That's what they've said. From the evidence of what we know from various sources, this was uh, not an attempt at escalation. Probably the militia, the terrorists who got through with this attack were as surprised as the Americans that it succeeded because after 180 attacks that failed, why would one succeed? The latest uh, versions we're hearing from the US are that uh, it was the uh, militia attack confused the US defense systems around the base. Uh, Something that some of these anti-US groups have been doing in recent years, and remember, there are dozens of US bases in the Middle East, and there are lots of hostile forces that perpetually try to kill them. This is perpetual. It's it's picked up since October 7, but it's perpetual. So they've had lots of practice, and one of the things that they've uh, developed is a pattern of when a US base sends a drone out, either a surveillance drone or an armed drone, the militia groups, the anti-US groups, will try to mimic that. They'll copy the flight path. They'll try to come in around the same time as the other drone, the US Americans' own drone is expected, and try to mimic that drone to defeat the defences around the US base. And it looks like that's what happened in this case. It looks like, based on the preliminary information we have, uh, that this militia group's drone was trying to uh, copy the US drone's movements and got through. So really, is this an argument for declaring a new war against Iran, or is this an argument for improving base defenses for US military installations in the Middle East? I'd suggest it's the latter. Okay, but it does make me wonder, though, whether this is still perhaps a pivotal moment. And I mean, could this tip the United States into a direct war with Iran? We know that Joe Biden has until now been actively trying to avoid a wider war since October 7th. But as you mentioned just before, he is receiving a lot of flack by Republicans on his home turf that he's been too soft on Iran. So could this push him to, I guess, do something quite strong? Well, that's the risk and the temptation. It's an election year in the US. Trump has said that this attack only occurred because Biden is weak. I hope I'm not right about World War III because you're very close to World War III. I'm not predicting it, but I'm saying you're very close. We have a man negotiating for us who can't put two sentences together. He can't see the stage. He can't find the, the stairs to get off the stage. Other Republican congressmen, senators have said that unless Biden attacks Iran directly, he is a coward. Uh, John Bolton, a very famous American former national security advisor to Donald Trump, among other things, has for years been calling for a regime change war against Iran to remove the Ayatollahs and to neutralize Iran as an American enemy. So there's a long history and there's a big accumulation and it's now come to a crescendo. And the Republicans are piling the pressure on. Now, if Biden has a moment of weakness, he might be tempted to act on that, Mm. to prove his so-called toughness. But if he were, it would be a moment of uh, tremendous imprudence, shall we say, to start a new war with a very powerful nation state. It happens to be very close to developing nuclear bombs, by the way. And so the timing of the attack, I think, also perhaps puts pressure on Joe Biden and it makes things particularly tricky because it took place as the White House was pushing for a hostage deal between Israel and Hamas that could potentially lead to a two-month ceasefire in Gaza. So how could that possibly play into Joe Biden's calculations, do you think? Yeah, good point. You know, the reason that we are in this situation, that these attacks have stepped up, that these American troops are dead, is a corollary of the war that's going on between Israel and Hamas. And what it illuminates is that the longer the Israeli war with Hamas continues, Uh, the more pressure it creates, the more friction, the more violence is generated all around the region on multiple fronts and is now 
had this particular effect. So this is an increasing cost day by day, mm. not only on Israel, not only on, of course, Hamas, and of course, the Palestinian civilians who are caught up in this, mm. but it's an increasing cost to the US and its interests as well. Not only does it, you know, in this case, kill and injure troops, uh, but it distracts the US, it creates this whole momentum now about Iran, when it's not the big pressing threat to the US and to, to freedom in the world, if I can put it that grandly. It's a serious enemy, but it's not an imminent threat. So while that's all going on, that increases the pressure on the US in particular to bring about the ceasefire that you were talking about, to somehow uh, uh, try to get a deal for a ceasefire uh, to stop the Israelis attacking to get the get Hamas to release the hostages and all the other conditions that would attach to that. So this becomes a more and more urgent priority uh, because every day the, the larger costs keep increasing and this, this fire keeps spreading. So really we're talking about Joe Biden needing something of like a Goldilocks solution. So not too hard a response that he sparks an actual war with Iran and then not too soft that he's seen as cowardly or just prolongs the conflict. Is that right? Exactly. So there are plenty of options. Um, there are plenty of targets available, anti-American militia groups, but this one in particular. I mean, if the US can manage to uh, retaliate against that group, do it as much damage as possible to that, and or other Iranian proxies who have been attacking the US, that's most unlikely to start a war with Iran. It's the way to reduce the risk to U.S. assets uh, without actually stumbling into a war. So that'd be the sensible thing to do. That'd be the Goldilocks answer. But Goldilocks was a fairy tale and you don't often encounter Goldilocks in real life, unfortunately. That's a good point, Peter. Now, I wanted to ask you something that you've just written, which I thought was really interesting and I hadn't seen elsewhere in the analysis about this latest escalation, which is that this isn't the only pressure that Biden is now facing, mm. finding this Goldilocks solution, but rather many of America's allies have become increasingly under threat from various autocracies. And that if each of these allies were all to ask the US to come good on its promised support at the same time, it could be disastrous. So how disastrous and how likely is this? So what I picked up was um, there's a British analyst called James Crabtree, uh, who has written a piece in the last few days in an outfit called Foreign Policy in the US. And Crabtree makes the point that the US has 50 allies or so, which is a powerful network of allies, but if they all come knocking at once, uh, everybody's in trouble. And he said if that were to happen, or even if that they not came knocking, but that they apprehended that maybe there'll be so many others that come knocking, asking for an American assistance, uh, that it could create the equivalent of what he called a geopolitical bank run, where you know depositors fear that all the other depositors are going to take the money out, and there'll be none left for them. So that there's a run on the bank, and the bank, you know, banks generally become insolvent when that happens and collapse. So his point was that the U.S. has to exercise great prudence in how it deals with the evolving situation. Now, how realistic is this prospect? Uh, well, all fifty probably won't rush to the U.S. at once, and Crabtree himself said that prospect is remote. But what we do see is the biggest and most serious nation state uh, enemies of the US and its allies, including Australia, of course, is increasingly bellicose. We've seen in the last couple of years, obviously, Russia invades Ukraine and is now making threats against uh, other countries, NATO countries, including Finland and Poland. Uh, we see... Uh, just in the last couple of weeks, North Korea has dramatically, and if there weren't all this other activity going on, these other wars afoot, this would have been dominating global news for weeks. But the North Koreans have now escalated. After writing into the country's constitution that they wanted unification with South Korea, they've now deleted that. North Korea appears to have demolished a major monument in the capital, Pyongyang which symbolizes hope for unification with South Korea. Now, this comes days after the... They've said their plan now is to dominate, is to launch a war of conquest against South Korea and its US protector. They've got a long history of, of hostile rhetoric, but the ballistic 
and nuclear activity has really stepped up. And of course, just to remind ourselves, they have a proven nuclear capability now, North Korea. So that's going on. And of course, then you've got the war against Israel, which was, through Hamas, uh, sponsored, coordinated by Iran. And above, behind and beyond all of that, you see the, the only country that the Biden national security policy says is capable mm-hmm. of a sustained and systemic attack to destabilize the entire world system of open, free trade and democratic politics, China. So if all four of those enemies are active at once, mm-hmm. you've got a major, major problem uh, because they all threaten US allies, US interests, and then you start to see why Crabtree's scenario of a geopolitical bank run starts to become imaginable. So the US itself has to be very prudent in the way it uses its resources. And all along, officials have been saying that they are husbanding US resources against the day that there is a major crisis with China mm. because they're very wary of being uh, so caught up that they can't deal with the really big crisis if and when it emerges. So they've been very careful and they need to continue with that level of prudence. So just so I understand, is James Crabtree's broad point that if the U.S. were to actually enter into an unnecessary war with Iran, that it would use up all or much of its capabilities and therefore it would render it unable to help its allies and that essentially this would upend the global order? Exactly. That it would render the U.S. so busy, so committed not only supporting the Ukrainians against Russia, not only supporting the Israelis against Hamas, but fighting a war with a major nation state, which is what Iran is. It has a sophisticated air force, army, navy, that the whole thing. And that the US no longer has the capability to, if it's doing all of that, uh, to do much more. So of course, if I'm Xi Jinping, this is a brilliant opportunity for me to uh, advance on any of the fronts where I'm already pressing against other nations' territorial and political rights, including the Philippines, which has been it's been a very active uh, theatre for China in recent weeks, and of course the, the 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 biggest one, Taiwan, and others as well, India, <laughs> Vietnam, you name it. The China is pressing incrementally but relentlessly against a range of fronts. So yes, the risk is that the U.S. becomes so tied up and so committed that it it loses the ability to deal with uh, another crisis and to answer the calls of other allies. Thank you so much, Peter, for returning to us and uh, for your time. It's a pleasure, and we we all hope and pray for some prudence and restraint from everybody. That we do. Today's episode of Please Explain was produced by Julia Carcatzel, with technical assistance by David McMillan. Our executive producer is Ruby Schwartz. Please Explain is a production of The Age and the Sydney Morning Herald. If you enjoy the show and want more of our journalism, subscribe to our newspapers today. It's the best way to support what we do. Search The Age or smh.com.au forward slash subscribe. I'm Samantha Selinger-Morris. This is Please Explain. Thanks for listening.